Women with Horns by Cecilia Mengera Brainard. Dr. Gerald McAllister listened to the rattles of doors being locked and footsteps clattering on the marble floors. The doctors and nurses were hurrying home. It was almost noon and the people of Quebec always lunched in their dining rooms with their high feelings, where their servants served their soup, fish, eat, rice, and rich syrup plant for dessert. After they retired to their spacious air rooms for their midday siesta. Dr. Jamie Laurel even explained that The fractis was due to the tropical heat and high humidity. Even the dogs retreated under houses and shaded trees. Gerald could not understand this local custom. An hour full lunch should be more than enough. I barely had that when I was practicing physician in New York. Here I read his report about the cholera epidemic in the southern town of Karkar. It was an impressive report, well written, with numerous facts. Thanks to my vaccination program, the epidemic was now under control. This success was another feather in his cap, one of many he had accumulated during his stay in the Philippine Islands. No doubt, Governor General Taft or perhaps even President McKinley would send a letter of commendation. Politicians were like that. They appreciate information justifying America's hold on the archipelago. He glanced at the calendar on his ornate desk. It was March 16, 1903, a year and a half since he arrived at the port of Ubeck aboard the huge steamship from San Francisco, three years since Blanche died. His head hurt and removed his glasses to stroke his forehead. When the headache passed, he straightened the papers on his desk and left the office. He was annoyed at how quiet his wing at the Ubik General Hospital was as he walked past locked doors, patted palms, and sands filled spittoons. In front of Dr. Laurel's office, he saw a woman trying to open the door. She looked distraught and wrung her hands. She was a native Ubican. Gerald had seen her at the Mayo's functions, a commonly woman with brown skin and long hair so dark it looked blue. She wore a long blue satin skirt. An embroidered panawello over her camisa was pinned to her bosom with a significant brooch of gold and pearls. It's lunchtime. My Spanish is bad, and my Ubican dialect far worse. Dark fairy eyes flash at him. Comer. I know it's lunchtime. It wasn't 15 minutes ago. She tried the door once more and slapped her skirt in frustration. Tears started welling in her eyes. My husband died over a year ago. I'm sorry. I'm not. He was in pain for years. Consumption. I have been coughing and last night I dreamt of a funeral. I became afraid. I have a daughter. You see. Dr. Laurel will return a tree. You are a doctor. American doctors are supposed to be the best. Can you help me? I don't see patients. Ah, she said, curved eyebrows rising. She picked up her fan with a gold chain pinned to her skirt. Ah, a doctor who doesn't see patients. Her words irritated him, and he briskly said, Come back in a few hours. Dr. Laurel will be back then. She stood there with eyes still moist, her neck tilted gracefully to one side, and her hand languorously moving the fan back and forth. Meanwhile, It was nothing. I listened to her chest and back. 
There are no lesion, no TB. I told her to return in a month. I think she is spectacular. She can come back for checkup forever. With mischief in his eyes, Agustina Macaraig has skin like velvet if she were not my patient. Jamie, you're old. You and your woman, doesn't your wife mind? She is the mother of my children. Is she not? It was late Friday afternoon and they were promenading in the park, trying to catch the cool sea breeze. The park was in front of an old Spanish fort. There was a playground in the middle of the benches, were scattered under the surrounding acacia and mango trees. Children led by their yayas crowded the playground. Men and women walked or huddled together to talk about the day's events. As he walked by the playground, Gerald was surprised to see Agustina pushing a girl of around five on the swing. With the child pleading to do the pushing, Agustina got on the swing. He watched her kick her legs out and throw her head back, her blue-black hair flying about. She was laughing, oblivious to the scandal she was causing. The people don't approve of her. There is a saying here in Ubek. A mango tree cannot bear avocados. Gerald shrugged his shoulders. Look at her. Is she not delectable? People say she's wicked, like her mother. She has a very prestigious background. I can see why the people would despise a widow who cares on the way she does. But friend, you don't understand. Love her. She's one of us. It's just the Obigans love to gossip even when she's patiently nurses her husband. They said she had a lovers but for five years, she took care of him. The people of Ubek like to talk. Over their meals, they talk. After eating, they talk. Outside church after worshipping God, they still talk. During the afternoon walk, they talk. Just like we're talking now. I did not come here to gossip. I was perfectly content planning my bubonic plague campaign when you... Friend, you don't know how to enjoy life. Look at the sun turning red, getting ready to set spectacularly. It is a wonderful afternoon. You walk with a friend, you talk about beautiful women. About life, now let me finish my story. People say her, mother a simple laundry woman jumped over a seminary walls and behind those hollowed walls, under the Albert de Fuego trees, she bent the good one of Christ chosen. Ridiculous. Ridiculous? Nothing. The Bacalera almost as good as Havana's. Thank you, but I don't smoke. You don't smoke? You don't have women? You are a shell. Bringing you here was a car. Are all American doctors like yourself? If they are, I wouldn't be caught dead in your rich and great country. You look like a god from Olympus. Tall, blonde, with gray eyes. You're not fortified, yet you act like an old man. Jamie, skip the lecture and get on with your story. Gerald watched Agustina lull her head back. She was biting her lower lip. Afraid of how high she was. If you were not my boss, I will shake you to your senses. Anyway, the story goes that Agustina was born with the horns. Horns? At noon, her mother went to the enchanted river to do her wash, the spirit room at that time. Do you know what? Gerald shook his head to this nonsense. I swim almost daily at your so-called enchanted river, and I've seen nothing but fish and an occasional water buffalo, filthy animals. Well, maybe there are, or aren't spirit? No? Who are we to say there are none? The people say that her mother had, uh, how do we say, an encounter with Encantado in the river spirit? 
and Augustine na ito Fradak of the Fifth Encounter. Gerald watched her jump off the swing, her skirt swirling up, her shapely legs flashing before his eyes. Her mother bribed a carpenter to sew off her horns when she was an infant. She doesn't look much like a river spirit's daughter, Jamie. Beware! You can never be sure. She took the girl's hand and they ran into a group of women. Agostina carried on an animated conversation, then waved goodbye. Before she turned to leave the park, she looked briefly at Gerald. He caught her gaze but she quickly lowered her eyes and walked away as she had not seen him. On the way to the mayor's house, Gerald thought that attending social function was part of his job. He was not only UBEC's public health director, he was also an ambassador of sorts of the United States. The truth was, he didn't really mind social affairs at all. They kept him occupied when he was busy. He didn't have time to think about the past, to feel the shakiness that pain that had possessed him after Blanche died. During the day, he was fine. He worked, lunch, swam, went to promenades, and had rich frothy chocolate with the men. Later, he dined, sipped after dinner, brandies and liquors, and shot until they passed midnight. It was when the servant locked the doors and the house was still, when the only sound was the lonely chatter of the night watchman, that he would feel his composure slip away. His heart would palpitate and an uneasiness would overcome him. He would try to calm in his mind with thoughts, health education campaigns, sanitation programs, quarantine reports, but the disquiet would stay with him. Ah, good morning Dr. Gerald, the great American doctor who is wiping out cholera, smallpox, and bubonic plague from a beck. The people knew him, of course, and they shook his hand heartily. They congratulated him on his recent success in Car Car and inquired about his current bubonic plug campaigns. Rats transmit the disease. Therefore, getting rid of the pets by traps and arsenic poisoning would eliminate the problem. When the food was served on the long dining table with tall silver candelabras, the mayor teased Dr. McAllister for his squeamishness at the roasted pig. The women giggled demurely, covering their mouths with their hand painted fans or lace handkerchiefs, while the men laughed boisterously. The mayor's mother, the fat old lady with a mustache, Tore off the pig's ear and pressed it in Gerald's hand. Taste it, my American son, she said, laughing and clapping. The people urged him until he finally did. When he later went to veranda to drink the rice wine, he saw Gustina standing there, gazing at the stars. She looked different. Not the frightened woman at the hospital, not the carefree girl at the park but a proper ubican in black, with her hair done in severe bun. Curiously, the starkness enhanced her grace and beauty, calling attention to the curves of her body. You did not like the lechon? I beg your pardon? Oh, the pig? What do Americans eat, Dr. McAllister? She was studying him, eyes half closed with one-sided smile that was very becoming. Pies, cherry pies, boysenberry pies, I miss them all. Frankly, I have... And he caught a warm, musky scent coming from her body. I have lost 10 pounds since I've been here. In kilos, how many? Around four and a half. Santa Clara. You must get rid of your coat. 
she must be an incompetent starving you like that. It is a shame to the people of Quebec. I like you. You and I have kinship. Come to my house and my daughter and I will feed you. Nothing exotic. Just something good. You know where I live? They did the shook his head. His knees were shaking. The house at the mouth of the river. I see you swimming during siesta time. I like to swim at night when the moon is full. She look at him, close her eyes languidly and walk away. After dinner, Gerald hurried home and paced his bedroom floor. He should have been flattered at Megosina's advances, but he was angry and confused. He was enchanting and desirable, and he was upset that he should find her so. What she had been unfaithful when Blanche was bedridden. The surgical nurse who laughed a lot had been willing, and he had wanted even for just a few hours to forget, to be happy. Blanche had known just by looking at him. Oh, Tiger, how could you? How could you? After her death, he had not given this side of himself a thought. Yet now, he found himself recalling that indescribable masky woman said, emanating from Agustina. There was something else. It bothered him deeply. That Agustina, widowed for only a little over a year, would laugh, be happy, even flirt outrageously with him. Why she was not consumed with grief? Why did she not sit at home, chattering with dollies? Why did she not light the candles in the crumbling massy churches? The way proper you began widow state, he was outraged at her behavior. He condemned her for her life that rose out of her, when he needed every once of his strength just to stay sane. He strode to his death and stared at the album with photographs, which he had not looked at in years. The wedding picture showed a virulent smiling girl with a ring of a tiny white flowers around her blonde curly hair. His face was unlit then, and his mustache seemed an affection. Ash's eyes peered through round eyeglasses, as if he knew then that the future would give him anguish. He studied the other pictures, serious stereotypes that unleashed a flood of emotions. He found himself weeping at some, smiling at others. He remembered Blanche's soft voice. Oh, Tiger, I adore you so. Blanche in bed, and later, Blanche in bed, pale, thin, with limp hair. She had been eaten bit by bit consumption. She had been consumed. Only a skeleton that coughed incessantly and spat blood remained. Gerald did not believe in God, but he prayed for her death, just so it would end. When she died, she was surprised to feel another kind of grief, more cute, more searing. After her funeral, his mind would go on and on about how useless he was. A doctor whose wife died of consumption was a failure. And always the soft voice, Oh Tiger, how could you? Returning from his work each night, he had found himself waiting for her voice. Oh Tiger, how could you? Returning from his work each night, he had found himself waiting for her voice. How was your day, Tiger? He saw a slight woman with curly blonde hair and he followed them. He plunged into a depression at eating, unable to work, to think clearly, to talk coherently. He stayed shut up in his room with wine-colored ribs. At least he thought he was losing his mind. He pointed a gun to his forehead, a part of him panicked and said, No, that part had taken over and started running his life again. Eat so you will gain weight, exercise so your body will be healthy, 
work so your mind will not dwell on the agony. Gerald went to Jamie's office to show him the letter. Jamie appeared cross. He sat erect and immobile as he listened quietly. Well, a letter? It's a fine letter, don't you think? The mayor's mother is dead. She choked on some food too bad. Well, at least it wasn't tied for or anything contagious. All you can think about is work. You have no soul. Rest of the morning, he felt a growing restlessness, a fog and aziness that he could not pinpoint. No soul. Had he indeed lost his soul? Was that why he could not feel and why he didn't care about anything? In trying to bring order to his life, in restructuring it after Blanche died, had he lost a vital part of himself? His soul? Funerals? Gerald thought as he walked into the mayor's house, where ready Maudrin affairs where people wore long faces and tried to sound sincere as they dug up some memory of the disease. He braced himself when he saw mourners in black and the huge black bow on the mayor's front door. Inside, he was surprised to see the number of people crowding the place. Some went, others laughed, and related real stories about the old woman. A rather festive air filled the place. What a tragedy, what a tragedy. She was eating pickled pig's nut when suddenly she choked. It was over before any of us could do anything. She loved you like a son and worried that you were too thin. I'm sorry. The mayor said as he pointed at the huge picture of a sleepy young girl wrapped up next to the coffin. She was a vain woman. The picture was taken almost half a century ago. Her mind was not clear. She wanted to be buried in her wedding gown, but it was far too small. I had to hardly seem to just to work all night. We ripped and stitched, adding panels to the cloth of the dress. It was still too small. Finally, we decided to cloth her another dress and to lay her wedding gown on top, pinning it here and there to keep it in place. Family deaths can be tiring. The old Spanish friar said a Latin mess and spoke lengthily about her goodness and kindness. She had a rich and long life. He concluded, six men picked up the casket and carried it downstairs. Near the hearse, an old man riding a horse stopped them. He was dressed in revolutionary uniform with medals hanging on his chest and a gun on his right hand, which he fired once, gasping the mourners to stop still. The old man ordered the man to open the casket. He got off his horse, went over the casket, and planted a kiss on the corpse lips. Then he got back on his horse and got off. It took a while for the mourners to compose themselves and continue to the ceremony. A pair of scissors was placed under the satin pillow. Family members kissed the body. The priest blessed the coffin and she was finally buried. That the first one was fated on his birth, his marriage, and his death. It is the end of a good life, my friend. It was a beautiful funeral. I have never attended one like it. <laughs> I guess it was. They were near a window, and she looked out. The moon is full. From his room, Gerald watched the large moon rise. 
signing on the star apple and jackfruit trees in his backyard. It was a warm night. Even with all the windows open, he waited for even the slightest breeze to stir the slippery leaves. But there was no wind, and the restlessness grew in him. At last, he decided to go to the river. Silence and oppressive heat dominated Yubek. As he walked the cobblestones, he reached the path leading to the river and the sea. The moon was so bright that the air seemed to private as he followed the trail that winded, then narrowed, then winded, widen, until he re- reached the river bank. After leaving his things under the coconut tree, he walked to the water and saw how clear it was. Little gray fish darted between colorful rocks. In the distance, the river and sea shimmered brilliantly. The water felt cool and silky. Gerald swam back and forth, marveling at the braceness of the fish that brushed against him, some even nibbling his toes. He spotted a bright green rock and wondered about it. Diving at the river bottom, he fetched it. When she surfaced, he saw her standing next to his things. He was not surprised. He knew she would be there. Moonlight bathed her, making her glow. A green and red tapis was wrapped around her, exposing golden shoulders and neck, showing mounds of flesh. Gerald felt like steering in him and folding his breath. He waded to the shore. She walked toward him. The water splashed and the small gray fish skittered away when she slipped into the water. He watched the river creep higher and higher as her tapis floated gracefully around her until they fell into each other's arms.